afternoon. My name is Tom Gustafson, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer with it says Hartzell Air Movement on the screen. That's our U.S. name, but uh, we do have an operating facility here in Singapore, and we'll appreciate any opportunities that you have for us to make contact with you and uh, talk to our sales guys here in Singapore. So today, our talk is about sound and fans. Uh, 30 minutes, all I can do is touch the very highlights. So what we're gonna do, is if we need to spend more time, we can. It's up to you. But at the end of the talk, there's going to be a test. Don't you love that, right? Now, I'll ask you three or four questions, and we have some prizes. Whoever gets the answers right, you can earn a water bottle or a little fan or a pen, whatever you like. So you have to pay attention. I'd say take notes, but you don't have to take notes. Right? When you talk about the sound, particularly as it relates to fans. There's a lot of terminology, so we're gonna go over the terminology very quickly because I don't wanna spend all our time talking about that. We'll talk some about how to properly select fans and also how to do some noise control. But the most important thing to remember out of this talk are four simple rules. So those are the things you should focus on as we go through this. Some of the terminology. How many of you have ever dealt with a fan problem in terms of sound, or any sound problem as far as that goes? Okay. So some of you? Well, the terminology can be very confusing, but it doesn't really need to be. The acoustic, people that are into acoustics, try to treat a lot of this like black magic, very special, but it's really not. So we're going to talk about these different terms and try to get you to understand just in a very brief way. If you don't understand these terms, it's hard to talk about sound. So a decibel. A little later on, I'm gonna show you a slide that talks about the broad range of sound that our ear can pick up, right? From very quiet, like a whisper, to extremely loud noises. And we don't like to deal with very large numbers so a lot of sound is converted into decibels. And this is just kind of the, the base for it. When you convert something to logarithms, here's the, here's the first rule I want you to remember, is double the noise is three decibels. So keep that in mind as, as we go forward. So there's some examples. So if you have a, a fan or any device making 85 dB, and you turn on another device that's the same noise, the result of is 88. Okay, so just remember, twice the noise is three decibels. And that comes into play a lot a little bit later on. The other terms are sound and power. And the power is very much like a light bulb. Think about a light bulb. I should have put a CFC light bulb up here in today's world, but uh, think about a light bulb. You can't tell how much power is going into that light bulb just by looking at it, right? So they're rated 100 watts, whatever they are. Sound power is like that. Nobody can really tell you what the sound power is without very specialized equipment. But they can tell you what sound pressure is, and that's what you hear. So the pressure is the, the waves, acoustic waves in the airstream, and that's what your ear hears. And everybody uses sound pressure. And we'll talk a little bit about why there's two different types of numbers here. We also deal with frequencies, and that's cycles per second. And frequencies, I use the AMP terminology here because that's the Air Movement and Control Association. But the same things are in the ISO documents around the world. The important part about frequencies is Sound has amplitude and it has frequency. So you have to understand both pieces of that. Down at the bottom of this chart, we show you the, the different octave bands. And we won't go into a lot of detail here, but it's a lot easier to deal with eight single numbers than a whole spectrum of numbers. So it's all combined into octave bands. So let's talk about the human ear for just a minute. 
here's the slide I was mentioning. 10 to the 14th decibels, the difference between the very quietest noise and the very loudest noise. And because of that wide range, we, we convert that to into a logarithmic scale. And so the human breath I have up there is about 10 decibels. That's at the very lower limit of what you can hear. Your automobile going down the highway is about 100. And a very, very loud noises. You don't want to be near 200 decibels, right? It'll, it'll ruin your eardrums. But something about our ears, and you'll know this is true, they're very insensitive to low frequencies. Right? How many of you know or see a car go by and they've got the big amplifiers and the bass is just thumping as they go by? Well, the reason you can hear, you can stand high amplitudes of low frequency is your ears aren't sensitive to it. So they've done a lot of tests with people and they've, they've run this test which leads up to this important next rule. They take people in a room and they say, here's a noise, you know, close your eyes, listen to this noise, and then we're going to turn on more noise. And they keep turning on more noise and more noise, and they ask people, when does it sound like twice the noise level? So they'll turn on two devices of the same noise, and then how much more is that? Rule number one, three decibels, right? And they'll ask people, is that sound twice as loud? And nobody will say yes. And they'll turn on two more devices. Now you have four devices, so that's three plus three. That's six decibels. And they'll say, does that sound twice as loud? And really, you have to get very, very large numbers before people will say that it's twice as loud. Very few people can understand or pick up the difference in a three decibel change. Now, if you're in the acoustics world, you can. I mean, you're used to it. And some people have better hearing than others. But most people have a very difficult time telling when two sounds are three decibels apart. So that's the second most important rule to remember. Let's talk about how we get, in particular, fan sound. Okay, my company makes fans. So we understand fan sound. But all these principles apply to everything else in, in life. So we use AMCA standard 300, and what this picture shows is there's many ways to test for sound. The most repeatable method is 300, which is called a reverberant room. So if you can picture that this room we're in, was we were going to test the fan for noise. The room has to be specially designed. Uh, it has hard concrete walls. There are there are devices in it to break up any standing sound waves. And the reason is you want to get a good average number. But remember, sound pressure is what you measure with a microphone. It's what you hear. And you can't tell by measuring sound how much sound is really being put into the space. All you can get is the output, whatever is coming to the microphone. So this method, we take a known device which has a calibrated level and we turn it on and measure the noise with a microphone. Then we turn that device off and we start up the fan and we measure that level with the microphone. And knowing the sound source from the calibrated source, we can then transfer that calibration to the fan. So what we generate as a result is sound power. A known sound power transferred through a mathematical method to the sound power of the fan. The reason that's important is if you put a fan or any device in different acoustic environments, it will sound different. And you know this by experience. You walk into a brand new house with nothing in it, just hard floors, hard walls, no furniture. What does it sound like? It echoes, right? But if you put the furniture in, you put the carpet on the floor, and you put a bunch of people in the room, the same sound now is very much quieter. So it's a function of the room it's in. So you can't measure, you can't take any device and say, okay, I measured the noise, now I know what it is. The microphone will give you the right answer. You have to also take into effect the room constants and the room qualification. 
So that's how we get fan sound, and, and a lot of things get tested that way. The other part about fans in particular is you have to know which piece of the sound you're concerned about. Are you concerned about the discharge noise, or are you concerned about the inlet noise? And that's all a function of where you're going to use the product. If it's blowing into a process, maybe there's an operator down there and you want to be concerned about the discharge noise. So it all depends on what you want to do. The other important part, and this kind of ties to air performance, but it also ties to sound performance, is it depends on how you run the test. So you can have a free inlet on a fan, you can have a duct on a fan, and you will get different answers. You'll get different answers on the air performance, and you get different answers on the sound performance. And they're all <coughs> somewhat interrelated. So we use a calibrated sound source, like I mentioned. We transfer that calibrated data over to the fan. And that, that's what allows us to calculate the ratings. So that's very, very brief background. I didn't really have time to develop a lot of that, but that's OK. You need to think also about a fan selection. I use the word fan because we're a fan company, but the same thing applies to pumps, any rotating equipment. There's a lot of fans that will do the same performance. A lot of fans, there'll be different efficiencies, and in a general way, a fan with lower efficiency generally has more sound. It's not 100% true, but in general that's true. A lot of our products are AMCA certified. What that means is AMCA has tested the product and they agree with our ratings. That's very important for sound. If you're running into a sound problem on a, on a job and you complain to the manufacturer, if they aren't AMCA certified with some type of certification, they can literally tell you anything they want. Right? So you, it's just one of those things that happens. The other thing that happens with comparing noise between two different manufacturers is I can present the data in many, many forms. I can present sound power, which think back to what that was. That's the energy the fan is putting into the space. Regardless of the space, that's the energy going in. That's the most consistent value to use. I can also give you a calculation of how loud the fan will be in a specific room. It's a concrete mechanical room or it's a outdoor space, right? The resultant sound is totally different depending on where you put the fan. Then there's some other acoustic things, a Q factor. It's kind of hard to explain, but picture Picture a sound source hung up in the middle of a football field or a soccer field, up off the ground. How much of a sphere, what percentage of a sphere can the noise radiate? The whole sphere, right? So fans, sound source is way up here. The sound can generate in all directions. In acoustic terminology, that's Q equals one. One being a whole sphere. Now if I take that same sound source, and they sit it on the ground in the middle of the soccer field, how much of a sphere can the sound radiate over? A half a sphere, right? Because it can't go into the ground. So that's Q equals two. So it's really the inverse of the sphere. If I take the, oh, and by the way, if I measure the same sound, if it's 85 when I hang it up in space and it's radiating in a whole sphere, and I take that sound and put it on the floor, it's radiating in a half a sphere, how much louder is the fan? Rule number one, three decibels, okay? So you, you're putting the same energy into half the space, you've doubled the energy in the space, that's three decibels, okay? Now, take the same idea and put it right here at the junction of a wall and the floor. Now the, now the sound can generate into a fourth of a sphere, right? Q equals four. How much louder is it? Again, three more. So the source up in space versus the source down here with a wall and a floor is six decibels different. 
huge impact on where the source is sitting. So you need to understand that. A lot of people will publish data showing the sound radiated by a sphere hanging up in space. And the only way you'll know that is it'll say Q equals one. So pay attention to that. You gotta compare the, the same two things. Now there's a lot of other things that come into play. We mentioned fan efficiency. All these things happen too. If you put bad ductwork connections up to a fan, you disrupt the airflow, you generate turbulence, the noise goes up. It's absolutely gonna happen. We talked a little bit about elevating the fan above the floor. Letting the noise radiate into more portions of a sphere will have a huge impact on the noise that gets distributed in the space. The number of walls, we talked about materials of construction like carpet on the floor, carpet on the walls. All those things affect greatly the noise in the space. Now it has to do with the, the, the volume Important rule number three, it has to do with the volume of the space you're radiating the noise into. Does anyone know the formula for the volume of a sphere? Okay, pi r cubed, basically, yep. So, if you double the radius of a sphere, you get a lot of extra space, a lot of extra volume. And if it's on, if it's on the floor, a hemisphere, and you double the radius, you, in essence, you end up with 6 dB different because you're on a, on a floor, it's a square instead of a cube. So the way this works is, if the sound can generate often in any direction and you double the distance from the sound source, you get to subtract 6 dB. So here's another thing you gotta watch for. People will generate data and they'll say, okay, here's the sound of my fan or pump or whatever at 10 meters. Well, that's fine, it's a calculation. But how many times is your human being gonna be 10 meters away from that source? And if they're not, then the sound that they're giving you doesn't make any sense. So you need to get values that are representative of where the person's actually standing and actually working. So where does, in particular, fan sound come from? Well, a lot of places. Most of the time you think about the aerodynamic noise, the blades, right? And you can put your head out the window when you're driving down the interstate and there's a lot of noise. That's all aerodynamic noise. And it generates a lot of, a lot of different frequencies. Um, it's just the way, the way things are. Think about a fan in particular, this being a fan blade, right? It's just beating at the air and it just generates a lot of noise. So there's some other parts of that. The, the blade pass frequency is generally inside a fan at least, there's a stationary component. It might be a cutoff, it might be a part of the housing. And every blade that goes by makes a thump, acoustic thump. And so you'll pick that up when you're doing, when you're looking at the, at the frequency analysis, you'll see a big spike in that data. So the blade pass frequency is another important part. So if you have an application where low frequency noise is a problem, sometimes you can solve that by putting in a fan with more blades. Because if you run that at the same speed, that frequency goes up. And it's, one thing about acoustics is, higher frequencies are easier to attenuate. So think about low frequency, that example I gave you, the boom box in the car. You can hear that coming, what, a long ways away, right? because low frequency travels long distances. If you can increase the frequency to higher frequencies, they don't travel as far before they get attenuated. So that's one way to deal with the blade pass frequency. A lot of other mechanical things come into play, like what's shown on the slide. And a lot of people forget about vibration. A, a product can be vibrating, and the rotating component may be very quiet, but it's vibrating and maybe there's a piece of sheet metal or a mount that's shaking and making noise. Then at least in fan systems, there's a, a whole other thing that affects acoustics. This is primarily, can be the biggest impact and it's called a system effect. 
designers try to design good systems, right? They, they don't put elbows right on, right on fan discharges if they can help it. Uh, sometimes you can't help it. And so every time you disrupt the acoustic, or the aerodynamic signature of the fan, you're going to affect the acoustic signature. And I'll show you some pictures that will uh, help you understand that. So the system effect is a function of the location of the fan in the duct, the duct design, and it affects the acoustic impedance. So here's a good picture of the sample. If you've been in the field, have you ever seen a fan installed like that? Okay, that's a centrifugal fan discharging vertically, and immediately on the discharge, they put a 90 degree elbow, and then went three or four feet or a couple of meters and put another 90 degree elbow. Not only does this reduce the aerodynamic performance by about 20%, I've seen installations like this add 10 decibels, even 12 decibels to the noise level because the air does not like to make all those corners that fast. So good fans sometimes go bad. And uh, so think about the system effect. What is it that's increasing the noise level? And here's a really old picture. They obviously have oversized that fan. Right? What should be on that fan discharge? It should have a transition. That can generate huge, huge increases in sound. Here's, here's another one that we found at a, at a school woodworking shop. They ordered the wrong rotation. And so they had to put all these elbows in to get this cyclone to work right. After they, they complained about noise on this fan, and after they fixed it, the noise went down six decibels. Just because of all this, all these transitions and disrupting the airflow, airflow, six decibels is how much noise? Four times. Okay, went from a very noisy application to a, a relatively quiet application. So how do you control fan noise? We've talked a lot about how to prevent it. That's what a lot of that was about, right? Good system design. You have to know. What part of the of the system is important? You know, don't worry about the noise going upstream. Maybe that's going into a process somewhere and there's nobody there. Worry about the noise that's coming out the discharge. So how do you fix things? Ductwork design is very important. Try to stay away from those system effects. This picture shows a discharge silencer. This fan's discharging vertically. So there's a round silencer on the discharge. And Silencers are very effective. This silencer here will take out about uh, about 15 decibels. So they're they're a very effective solution for for particularly fan noise. You can build a complete enclosure around the fan, right? So sometimes you can't help it. The fan's going to be noisy depending on the application. So you can you can build a box around it, an acoustic enclosure. Sometimes you just have to worry about the fan housing. And in those cases, they put a sound blanket just on the housing. So that's a lot cheaper way to solve it. Now this picture is a direct drive fan. But if you have a belt drive fan, this rule number four can apply. Right? So think about an application. Your customer calls you up and he says, your fan's too loud or your pump's too loud, whatever the case may be. How can you reduce the noise? and you look at silencers, you look at enclosures, and none of that's going to work. Well, one solution might be to slow down the fan. A lot of times, systems don't need as much pressure as they were, as somebody thought, because they put, you know, special factors in, right, to make sure that the system's going to work. Well, the fan could be overperforming, and you can slow the fan down. And we won't go through the math, but a 15% speed change is three decibels. So your customer calls you up and he says, okay, yeah, the fan's overperforming. You can slow it down a little bit and you slow it down 15%. And you tell your customer, okay, I slowed the fan down. Is it okay now? And his answer is what? His answer is no. Okay, because remember the one rule? Most people can't really hear three decibels. So he calls you up and he says, it's still not good. Come out and do something else. So you go out and you slow it down again. 
another 15%. So now you've got six decimals, right? Three the first time, three the next time. And he's, he's happy with the sound, but now he complains because there's no performance, right? <laughs> it's because you're running 30% slower. So now the same thing is true on the other side. Your customer could call you up and say, my fan is, I gotta increase the speed a little bit. Do I have to worry about the noise? And you can increase it 15% to get his airflow performance, and it's still only three decibels, and he probably won't notice the difference. So it can help you in that case. Sometimes it helps you, sometimes it hurts you. So here's the test. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Got parts of mug you can choose from, and a couple other small things. Shameless advertising, right? That's okay. Here's the here's these rules. So what I what I want to have somebody do is answer the questions, right? So the first rule we went over was how many dB higher is it if it's twice the noise? Okay, three dB. Okay, so. When you go out, make sure you get a prize on the way out, okay? <laughs> so 3 dB, that's right. And that's a very, very important piece to remember. Number two, most people can't tell the difference between two sounds that are how many dB apart? Yeah, 3 dB. Most people can't tell the difference if it's only 3 dB. Where do they start picking up the big differences? 6 dB, okay? Number three, in a... In a free field, sound decays how many decibels if you double the distance? Get twice as far away, and how much does it go down? 6 dB. Well, I don't know if I got enough prizes. A lot of you are getting these, okay? And the last one, what percentage change? 15%. Now, you can, you can apply these ideas to any rotating equipment. It's not just fans, even though we talked about fans. The one thing I want to help you understand about uh, particularly the third one, and a little bit about, you saw up on the slides was something I called the free field, and, it, and it's referenced here in, in number three. A free field is defined, and this is as important as knowing the distance, and it's as important as knowing the speed it's running and all that. A free field is a a condition where the noise isn't reflecting back from any other surface. So it's not bouncing off that wall and coming back. It's not bouncing off the ceiling and coming back. It's free to dissipate. Why is that important? Well, a lot of times people will try to walk up to a, a fan or a pump or a, anything making noise and they'll say, okay, my specification says I have to be 85 dB and I have a meter and I'm going to walk up one meter away from that device, and I'm gonna measure the noise. That doesn't work, and here's why. The best way to understand it is, picture you're gonna throw a small rock into a lake, and you throw the rock in the lake, and the, you get a splash, right? And then what happens? The waves, they, they travel out, right? So, as they travel out, the amplitude decreases because the energy is getting dissipated. But what if, what if you were, your assignment was to measure the height of that wave right where the rock hit the water? How accurately could you measure that? You can't, right, because it's a splash. That's called the near field. And the near field on anything that's making noise covers a long distance. If you have a 12-inch diameter fan sitting on that table, and try to measure the noise any closer than about 10 feet away, you are in the near field. And it's very sensitive. You can be off a couple inches, you can go this way a little bit and get totally different readings. Because in the near field, in the splash zone, okay, the noise is totally random and you can't get a good measure. You have to get far enough away from that source, like the rock in the water, so that you get the concentric waves slowly dissipating out. That's the only way you can get good consistent readings. So if your customer says, I want to know, you know if the fan or the pump you put in 
that one meter away is going to meet the requirement, you have to tell them you can't measure it there because it's in the, it's in the near field and none of the rules apply. So you can use that example, explain it to them. You can't measure the splash where the rock hits the water. You have to get a little further away. Large devices, say a, a two meter fan, you may have to be 20 meters away to get out of that splash zone acoustically. So keep all these things in mind. There's nothing really fancy about acoustics. You just gotta understand the basics and understand how they interrelate. So in conclusion, you gotta select the proper fan. You gotta install it right. You gotta pay attention. Make sure you don't have system effects and all these other crazy things that we talked about. I mentioned at the beginning, we have a facility here in Singapore. Our guys are standing in the back. We have a booth over in the corner. We're more than happy to talk to you. Our parent, I'm from Pequa, Ohio, in the US. All right, we have a manufacturing plant there. So we're, we're more than happy to solve any of your problems. And uh, we're gonna show you just a, like a, was it less than two minutes, I think. Short video that shows, this is our, this is our, our lead team here. So I'll just have you listen to this for just a second. I am Sean Steinle, president of Hartzell Air Movement. Hartzell has a long, rich history of over 137 years. And today, Hartzell continues to grow dynamically and globally, focused on our customer needs. Hi, I'm Tom Gustafson, Chief Technology Officer at Hartzell Air Movement. We are dedicated to providing our customers with innovative solutions that help keep them competitive. Hello, my name is Patrick Schneider, Director of Engineering and Product Development. We take pride in manufacturing quality, custom-designed fans to meet our customer specifications. Hi, my name is Randy Pearson, Chief Financial Officer. At Hartzell, we value our relationships with our customers, and we work hard to provide them with a safe, energy-efficient product. Hi, my name is Chuck Abramson, Director of Sales and Marketing at Hartzell. We have a commitment to our customers to provide quick, reliable service. Now we'd like you to hear from the rest of Hartzell. Let's work together!